So slicing and dicing with consequences. I feel a little odd because we're in the API design track, and you hear a lot about you know API first, API as a contract, yeah, and, and Tony is, is quite a close colleague of ours. In fact, uh, Swagger, or back then, Swagger was, uh, we were the first to actually code gen this in Node using our framework in Loopback, and we highly believe in an API design first centric uh, methodology. However, as a practitioner, and as someone who's left holding the bag to actually implement all this stuff on the back end, we have our, our concerns and our thoughts as well. So that's why the, the, the title for the presentation. What we endeavor to do in microservices has a profound effect on API design. <clears throat> so a little bit about me. Um, one of the distinctions that I, I have is uh, I don't believe in building stuff that I wouldn't otherwise use because, quite frankly, that's where I came from. I'm a practitioner who's done this before for many years uh, at scale, uh, been left holding the bag with technology that was either open source or proprietary, and we don't like to pay for tools that otherwise don't meet the criteria of what would be sustainable. I don't like producing those tools as a vendor to my customers and former colleagues uh, that, do, that, that do these things for uh, slicing and dicing microservices and having APIs. Uh, so, been in the community for quite a bit as a consumer of open source, and one day I thought, well, gee, I'm, what I'm building here can be open source, and we should give back to the community as a producer of open source. So a little bit about me and my, my background and, and why I'm here. So you guys have probably uh, have heard of microservices and this whole notion. I'm not going to go too much into this, but to go give a little bit of background to reiterate, you have the monolithic app as such. And one of the key things, if you step back as to why this is all happening, two parts, right? So the speed of innovation and the technology is constantly uh, being updated. And the requirements to do so are, are happening at the exponential rate as well. We're feeling regulatory and user experience pressure from a business requirements perspective to innovate quicker, which means that this monolithic app to get across the door is not going to cut it. And one of the key drivers is a developer or community-based thing called microservices. And you stop to wonder, like, well, you know, microservices is really nothing new. There was this thing called SOA back then. Absolutely. SOA had the right idea. And with the technologies that were there at the time, we had SOAP. We had enterprise service buses. We had lots of heavyweight technology that evolved inside the enterprise and was driven sort of top down visionary wise. But guess what? The developers across all of these enterprises were going against what the web was doing. What did the web evolve into? It evolved into connectivity through REST, while the rest of the inter entire enterprise evolved in SOAP. And that's, that was the idea behind SOA. So then everyone stepped back and said, well, gee, that didn't really work out well. And on top of that, we have all these monolithic applications that are services, but they're too big. And we can't innovate quick enough to meet these protocol changes that are going on to be exposed. So, and thus, the, uh, the birth of microservices. So evergreen, continuous deployment, innovation, compartmentalization, that's leading into this, this, uh, this trend of slicing and dicing. And again, nothing new, right? This is ideas that have been out there for quite some time. Uh, decades of best practices involved into what we call the modern era or the modern application as we coined it now. And we're riding off of the back, backs of the vendors who have actually achieved this and look back and go, well, we didn't call it microservices back then. Amazon, when you load up the web page, 128 some odd services or microservices that are powering what they've done. To them, if you ask an Amazon developer, it was like, well, it's a clean separation of concerns. We're really large. One team handles personalization, another team handles the catalog, and yet another team focuses on the customer. We had to innovate our organization and our application to, to meet the paradigm of what has evolved into microservices. The other big change that has come about is what we call now cloud native technologies. Uh, so this is a key thing because what was once, say, a 256 gig heap running on some JVM as a big monolith application spread across 
thousands of servers, we're realizing now that, hey, you know, with something like containers, with the, uh, the technology and specifications like Docker, we can actually compartmentalize these things. And a lot of the newer de technologies that are out there, for example, Propono, what I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I've been ch championing for some time, Node runs as a single process. In fact, you actually have to call its cluster API to spread it across different processes than across different cores. So we want to isolate these things, encapsulate them so that you have uh, discrete processes doing discrete things. You know where these things are and you spread them across whatever hardware, uh, either bare metal or through an orchestrator and that kind of thing. So cloud native technologies is something that actually has unlocked a lot of what we've been talking about here for microservices. Microservices go hand in hand. I would always say that if you're, if you're looking at the two sides of a coin here, microservices and APIs are the two faces of the same coin. Whether or not you're, doing, you're actively doing it for internal purposes versus external purposes, if you think about it, all development, all integration now is API centric. It's no longer, well, it's a service for X, Y, and Z. That X, Y, and Z could be an internal business unit. It could be that group sitting right across the aisle at, the, at uh, their other stations of developers to be, could be consuming what you're building. And that's the discreteness around the organizational principles for microservices. And therefore, what you surface as an API, eventually, if you're doing this right, the supposition is that I don't really know, nor do I really care who my consumer is, in theory, without the concerns of things like security. With good API design, I should be able to meet what they need. And so they, these two things are, are two sides of the flip coin. And the ultimate nirvana is if I've exposed my business functionality correctly, then I may not even know what the client is. A lot of what the businesses have been getting away with for quite some time is they have the luxury of knowing I'm supporting my web app. I'm supporting my mobile app. And guess what? that is no longer acceptable. If you're a CTO sitting at some big company, Fortune 500 right now, I can guarantee you, just like three years ago, what, when you were asked, what is your mobile strategy, and you didn't have one, you were out of a job. Times have changed now. People are asking now, what is your digital transformation connectivity strategy? Or, better said in, in API terms, uh, in technical terms, what is your API strategy? So here are some challenges, right, uh, going about doing this. Microservices are great in theory, but they're an architectural style. Sound familiar? REST, right? Same thing. Oh, it's, it's great to be able to have resources and have few operations that describe them and talk about representational states uh, and all this good stuff, but same thing for microservices. How do you actually slice and dice your business into a set of microservices? And on top of that, what if you have legacy? You don't have the luxury of doing greenfield implementations to structure what you think you had right. What do you do then, right? And even if you did have a magical cleaver to do this, there's so many ways to slice and dice your, uh, your, your application. So a couple of, of, of uh, permutations to this already. Business capability, domains and subdomains, model driven. This list is not a, a, a consummate by any means. But as you can see, when you're actually going through the physical exercise of defining what should be a microservice, then this becomes the conundrum as part of the problem. And on top of that, for each microservice in and of itself, what granularity? What's too small versus what's too big? We already ran into the issue of too big because with API-driven design, with the client driving everything with the known client, you know that that view, that presentation on that client is going to drive everything else on the back end. And that tug-of-war symmetry is now running ahead with what we're dealt with on the back end for microservices. That's the problem. Uh, so again, so what, how many services do I actually need on a per-host basis for microservices? And what are my hosts actually running on? The other uh, problem is that uh, inherently, as we talked about, 
APIs are for engagement. Microservices are not for engagement. If you think about it, it makes sense. We are, we are highly attuned to the experience for APIs through an API-driven design perspective because we are putting ourselves in the shoes of the consumer. Microservices is the entire opposite. For the person, again, using the analogy, holding the bag of having to sustain the data, the operations, and the exposure and the externalization of these things, microservices are the, the, act, the, the exact antithesis of all of this. So that leads to this problem. Well, I have these microservices depicted in these bubbles, and the client itself needs portions of these things to perform what the engagement is. So as an example, I have my customer name, and if I'm on Amazon, I have my item info, and maybe that item info has a rating, very common use case, but all three of these things could be different microservices that need to be then somehow magically put into the view, right? So what we're saying here is that that aggregation, that mashup is inherently needed for this, this problem. And on top of that, uh, if you were to do every permutation of this, uh, that leads into the other uh, problem. So for each engagement, there's many ways in which that engagement can be presented. So you remember when the smartphone came out. And in the smartphone uh, form factor, you could, you could show your, your customer, you could have item descriptions, and maybe you had a little bit of real estate to show this, you know, to some level of what the form factor could be. But then Apple announced, oh, you know what, we're gonna release this thing called the iPad. And it's just gonna be slightly bigger. Uh, and then what do you do, right? Well, you could display the same things, but then folks got smarter and they were like, well, if we're gonna have that much more real estate, then we're gonna expand this thing and we're gonna show some other element, like, for example, promotions at the bottom. And this is just an example of one engagement being expanded with different permutations driven by again, the consumer. And the consumer in this case is known, but the different permutations can vary, right? You have tablets, and now we're moving into wearables, right? And they have their own sets of challenges for constraints for data, battery, you name it. So in the end, what we're saying is the API more so than, than ever needs to be uh, dynamic. Um, and further compounding the problem here, as you can see, you're now supporting your desktop, you're supporting your phone, you're supporting your uh, tablets, you're supporting the end client. As you can uh, uh, derive now, that many of my microservices have portions of which need to be propagated into many of the different engagements and their permutations, right? The end factorial problem of what we're trying to, to drive with microservices. Microservices give, uh, give us fantastic maintainability but the composition of what we're trying to do here may, remains a challenge. So a couple of solutions, and this is based on uh, just my personal experience, but stuff that we feel strongly on um, because, well, it's worked in, in many occasions. So the first thing is um, you wouldn't go about doing anything. I mean, let, uh, I don't know, uh, take uh, war. You wouldn't go to war against your enemy without some kind of inventory on what you have. If you knew that uh, your, your opponent lived across the sea, the first thing you ask is, well, how many ships do we have? Or how many planes do we have to fly over the sea to, to get to them? Same principle. Start with a map. And whether it be business capability, domain-driven, or model-driven, here's a recipe, right? Map the major entities. Map the major entities first. And the reason for that is because if you start with the entities, you're going to get closer to what we have in reality. What is REST? REST is the basis of resources. So back with the opposite of what services were for RPC, right? Services was lots of operations modeled against key business capability on stuff that really mattered for us to transact against. Great. But then you had many, many operations, few resources. If you have many resources, few operations, then you have the ability to map yourself to the way the entire web is already, uh, has been uh, mapped. So start with your entities and then go back with your operations. 
Should those operations be part of the entity? Absolutely, they have to originate somewhere. But then if you think about it, for example, for banking, for things that are done day in, day out for atomic transactions, for example, debits and credits. Debit, you need a party to debit against, and then you need a credit to credit against when you do a transfer. You bubble up your first class operations. And what this means is, uh, and it's funny because when you think about REST and RPC and whatnot, an operation can be a resource. It doesn't have to be that you have a customer that does a transaction to do a transfer. You can have a bank transfer as a first class citizen. And especially if you know that that is like 80% of what your, your workload has been doing. And then treat everything as a resource. Start with that uh, is, is basically our, our supposition. Once you have this map and you have sort of this amorphous thing uh, and you're trying to go about uh, uh, figuring out your deployment and what this all means for microservices, you'll naturally answer question two through two means. One, what was traditional load as far as the time that you spent doing what, uh, what any one operation was? How much time does a bank spend on doing transfers? versus updating customer profile information. So when we work with banks, that was a very easy thing for them to ask. They didn't have to go to their Nagios or BI tools or any of this insider analytics piece. They just looked at this at the high level and they said, well, if we had to allocate a pool for how many services on, on how many hosts and at whatever granularity, this naturally will lead to how does our resources get consumed in the first place, regardless of how they're segmented. You'll know and you'll have technology to help you to, to scale this, for example, in Kubernetes, an orchestrator that's very common now. We, they're building auto scale for the number of pods for a backed service, should that service get hot, right? Back in my old digs at the e-commerce, we knew that during Q4, there was lots of transactions, but for the most part, most of the time, people were browsing through catalogs. And most of the time, for most e-commerce places, you're going to have a lot more browsers than the actual people who are going through buying and checking out, unless there's something like a flash sale. So continuing the map, look past your consumption. And if you can, project your future consumption. What does that mean by, by your future consumption? You know what entities are going to be mapped and what entities are going to be introduced and what those, the parity of those two, those two pieces are. Measure it, measure it from the baseline of what you have and let technology take the rest as far as the, the scale up. The granularity uh, question is, defined, is then basically dismantled by uh, uh, marking out your hotspots. So if you know that you have too fine grain to support a view, for example, then materialize that view. And we'll go into that a, a bit more because that basically gets into the heart of, uh, of the next few things here. So in microservices, there's this fancy thing called uh, command query responsibility segregation. And I, I kind of laugh at that because it's like, oh, this another, yet another fancy acronym. And the, the idea is quite simple. What you assemble as a model, as an aggregate, make that view friendly. But then don't use that same model when you actually have to go and do something with it that's costly, as in, say, an update, right? Make sense? And we did this all day long when we was just a very single three-tier app. Your client, your middleware, your database. Your database was a bunch of tables with many, many joins. And lots of people can relate to this. And then, over time, you realize, oh, that's taking way too long. And what, what, what emerged? emerged? You emerged with a view. And when you got smart about it and when you figured out that this thing was used all day long and your performance was, was hurting, you materialized that view. That same concept, that's what we call CQRS, bubbles up from the stack. And the reason for that is because you no longer necessarily own the data. Your application now is much more complicated as a composable enterprise. And this gets into uh, what we call the API gateway pattern. There's a key piece of application slash infrastructure that 
helps solve these things in these solutions once you've done your homework to, to, to bubble this up. So the first is there is a central piece of middleware that marries up everything that is what your application has now become. No one here, I'm sure, if you're building an application to core to your business, is, for example, doing their own geolocation. I would hope not, right? There's open maps, there's Google Maps, right? You're gonna focus on your core application, and if you need location services, you're gonna, you're gonna tie into some public API, right? And your core experience is driven by whatever services that you own. And you need something to basically marry this all up, and that is the role of the API gateway in the microservices model. If you look at what Fowler is trying to describe as this pattern, well, you have a central point of control, and then it is able to disseminate and talk to all of these things that are on the back end, many of which now you don't own. The second piece to this, uh, to the API gateway equation, uh, is a little further looking out. Uh, so again, if you've done your segmentation for microservices and you have these discrete packets of, of information, you have granularity at the right levels, but you haven't solved the end client problem. I have many, many resources. I have many, many endpoints. Some, in some form or fashion, I need to dynamically aggregate these things. So technology out there as well to be able to build these materialized views in a way where they can be composed, mashed up. Um, and one of the things that helps solve this that's emerging, for example, is GraphQL. So what was the DSL across many microservices that are exposed as, for example, REST or not, which is another important key point, to be able to marry these things into an aggregate view? Hasn't quite taken hold, even though it's been four or five years yet, but you know, there's movement, for example. The GitHub newest API for GitHub is all GraphQL. And GraphQL is starting to take uh, a further grasp at being able to decipher this problem because eventually folks will figure out the microservices uh, conundrum. And they'll have all these discrete things that they want to externalize. But the problem is they won't be able to shape an API that's agile, nimble, flexible, or dynamic enough to support what this client needs without it being somewhat composable composable not just at the level of the technology that, that gives us this at the back end, but also on the front end as well. Other attempts of this have been, for example, hypermedia uh, to, to do this. So to, to wrap up, um, just wanted to uh, do a quick plug. Um, we're a company called Lunch Badger. We just released an API gateway with the vision of what we just described here. Um, it's backed by us in partnership with Joint and has the backing of the Node.js Foundation as well. Um, it rides off of one of the biggest open source projects on the planet, uh, ExpressJS, um, and it's all driven by JavaScript. We felt so strongly about this, this use case and being able to do not just the API first part, but the back end part that we actually built a stack and a company around it. So we, we back Express Gateway. Uh, my former venture, uh, Loopback, actually helps you build APIs and slice and dice your existing functionality into microservices, all married up into a Docker-based Kubernetes orchestrated runtime.